From time to time, we all ask some deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? How do we give meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, as imponderable as these questions may seem, some people have uh, ready answers to them, such as, Morality is dictated by God in holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. Problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. Our tribe should claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. In the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Uh, many people know uh, perfectly well what they don't believe in, but it's been harder uh, to articulate what we do believe in. Um, I suggest in Enlightenment now that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, the one that we associate with the 18th century Enlightenment, namely that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Now, many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. As a result, they faded into the background as a kind of bland status quo or establishment. Other ideologies have passionate advocates, and I suggest that Enlightenment ideals, too, need a positive defense and an explicit commitment. And that's what I've tried to do in the book. Uh, the Enlightenment, I suggest, embraces four themes, reason, science, humanism, and progress. And uh, let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason, uh, with the understanding that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion, including faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, the hermeneutic parsing of sacred texts. Reason, in contrast, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you uh, insist that you're right, uh, give reasons why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. Now, human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable. Uh, cognitive scientists, my, my uh, own professional tribe, have shown that we are liable to generalize from anecdotes, to reason from stereotypes. We seek evidence that confirms our beliefs while ignoring evidence that disconfirms them. And we're all overconfident about our knowledge, our wisdom, and our rectitude. On the other hand, people are capable of reason if they establish certain norms and institutions, including free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact checking, and empirical testing, which brings me to the second Enlightenment ideal, science. Science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible and that we can understand it by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Science has shown itself to be our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important Enlightenment theme is that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable, just like uh, other beliefs about the world. The third ideal is humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings and, and other sentient creatures. Now, that might seem bland and unexceptionable and uh, trite, um, but in fact, there are distinct alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, the nation, the race, the class, or the faith to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same, to achieve feats of heroic greatness, or to advance some mystical force or dialectic or struggle or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Now, humanism is feasible because people are endowed with a sense of sympathy. This is another recurring theme in Enlightenment writings. That is, we can experience a concern with the welfare of others. Now, by default, our circle of sympathy uh, is rather small. We tend to feel the pain primarily of our genetic relatives, our close friends and allies, cute little furry baby animals, and that's about it. But our sense of sympathy can be expanded through the forces of cosmopolitanism, uh, 
the mixing of people and ideas uh, through education, journalism, art, mobility, and reason. The uh, understanding that as soon as I in, uh, engage in uh, rational discourse with you, I can't insist that only my interests are special because I'm me and you're not and hope for you to take me seriously. Finally, we have the ideal of progress, that if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. So 250 years later, how did that Lightman thing work out? If you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because I have learned that intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. <laughs> If you think we can solve problems, I have been told, that means you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition and false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, referring to the Voltaire character who declared, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, as it turns out, Pangloss was really a pessimist. A true optimist would believe there could be much better worlds than the one, one we have today. But all of this is irrelevant because the question of whether progress has taken place is not a matter of having a sunny disposition or viewing the world through rose-tinted glasses or seeing the glass as half full. It's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I submit, that is progress. Let's go to the data. Beginning with the most precious thing of all, life. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth hovered around uh, 30 years. But with the uh, advances in uh, sanitation, antibiotics, uh, and other advances in public health and medicine, life expectancy at birth has increased to 71 years um, worldwide. Almost no one guesses that it is that high. As with many measures of progress, the uh, geographic distribution of progress has been um, uh, hi highly um, uh, unequal. Uh, the first region to make the great escape, as Angus Deaton puts it, from universal uh, poverty and squalor and early death was uh, Europe and the Americas. But uh, Asia has almost caught up, and most recently, Sub-Saharan Africa is dramatically closing the gap. For most of human history, uh, child mortality uh, took place at a rate of about 33%. Um, uh, uh, even in a country that today we associate with as being with one of the most advanced in the world, Sweden, uh, 250 years ago, one third of Swedish children did not live to see their fifth birthday. Uh, that has been brought down by a factor of, of 100 to 3 tenths of 1%. And that is a uh, advance that was, has then been replicated in other parts of the world, such as in North America, Canada, in Asia, South Korea, in Latin America, Chile. Uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa has brought its rate of child mortality down from 50% to 6% in uh, just a few decades. That's still way too high, but the declines are continuing. Health. For most of human history, the uh, biggest killer was infectious disease. That is no longer a significant cause of mortality in uh, developed countries. And even in the developing world, uh, the rate of death from the five major infectious diseases ha has uh, come down. Pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and HIV AIDS just in the last 15 years. Sustenance. Uh, it takes uh, probably around uh, at least 2,500 calories per person of food that is uh, grown to sustain a, po a population. Um, with the agricultural revolution in England in the second half of the 18th century, for the first time England was able to uh, feed its population, followed by the uh, United States, France, uh, more recently China has developed the ability to feed itself, India is close behind, and here we have the graph for the world as a whole. Now, all of these 
uh, this would be a dubious example of progress if all of those calories were simply making uh, fat people still fatter. But in fact, uh, the rate of undernourishment has been in steady decline. Uh, it, as recently as 1970, about 35% of the world's population was undernourished. That has come down uh, to about 15%. Uh, again, the progress has been uneven across the world's regions. Latin America was probably the first to uh, make a huge dent in undernourishment, uh, followed by Asia, and now Sub-Saharan Africa is making progress. The most extreme consequence of insufficient food, of course, consists of famines. Famine was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but uh, famine, once, which once could be found in all the world's continents, has now uh, been uh, very close to eliminated except for the world's most remote and uh, war-torn regions. Prosperity. For most of uh, human history, there was little to no economic growth to speak of. This graph shows the gross world product from the year one to the present. And as you can see, until the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, there was practically no economic growth. Today, the gross world product is about 100 times greater than it was uh, 200 years ago. Uh, again, the great escape from universal wretchedness and squalor was uneven, with uh, UK and the US escaping first. But more recently, Asian countries like South Korea have uh, skyrocketed. Uh, here we see uh, Chile, China, and uh, India showing exponential growth as well. And there's the graph for the world as a whole. Again, one could uh, dispute that this was a form of progress if all of the gains were going to the proverbial 1%. But in fact, the increase in prosperity has been decimating extreme poverty, the uh, bare minimum thought necessary to feed oneself and one's family. 200 years ago, it's estimated that about 90% of the world's population lived in what we today call extreme poverty. That has been reduced to less than 10%. And the uh, UN has set as one of its sustainable development goals, eliminating extreme poverty everywhere by the 2030s. Uh, as a result, uh, since poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer, International inequality, differences between nations, has uh, turned a corner and is starting to decline. Uh, as Angus Deaton pointed out, uh, when the world first began economic growth after the Industrial Revolution, it was inevitable that international inequality would increase as uh, some nations escaped from poverty, uh, leaving others behind. But now that uh, uh, development has spread worldwide, the uh, international Gini index has turned a corner and is coming down. Now, of course, within developed countries, inequality is increasing, not decreasing. But uh, this does not mean that the uh, the straight that the situation of uh, poor people has worsened. Quite the contrary. For most of world history, even the richest countries devoted no more than 1.5 percent of their wealth to social transfers to benefit children, the aged, the sick, and the poor. But in the 20th century, every developed country went on a massive program of expanding uh, social redistribution, so that today the median among OECD countries is to devote 22 percent of GDP to social transfers. As a result, poverty in the United States, when it's measured in terms of disposable income, that is, after taxes and transfers, has fallen from about a third in 1960 to 7% uh, today. And when it's measured in terms of consumption, what people can afford to, to uh, buy, it's fallen even uh, further to about 3%. Peace. For most of human history, war was the natural state of relations between neighboring empires and states, and peace was a mere interlude between wars. You can see that in this graph, which plots the percentage of years that the great powers of the day uh, fought each other in uh, major wars. Uh, 200 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war with, a, with each other. Today, they are virtually never at war with each other. The last direct great power war pitted the United States against China uh, 65 years ago. If we zoom in on the um, 20th century, we see that uh, despite this overall decline in the uh, number of wars, the two of the wars that did take place caused massive uh, bloodshed, namely World War I and World War II. But despite predictions that many of us grew up with, that this was just the beginning of a crescendo, and that 
Uh, World War III pitting the U.S. and the Soviet Union was inevitable, and because it would be a nuclear war, it would be even more destructive. Uh, World War III never took place, and indeed, the period uh, after the end of World War II has shown a uh, uneven but unmistakable decline in the rate of deaths from, of war from uh, all causes, uh, including there were peaks for the, around the time of the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War, and the Syrian Civil War. But even with the worst war in a generation, namely the S Syrian Civil War, the global rate of death from warfare is uh, much lower than it was in earlier decades. Uh, freedom and rights. Uh, we have all um, deplored the recent backsliding from democracy and uh, rights in uh, countries like uh, Russia and Venezuela and uh, Turkey and Eastern Europe. Nonetheless, the overall trend over the last 200 years is for democracy to make uh, massive uh, inroads. These are data from the Polity 4 project. Uh, and the world has never been more democratic than it has been in this past decade, even with the backsliding. We have to, when we look at the um, upsetting developments in um, uh, Eastern Europe and elsewhere, we have to remind ourselves that uh, as recently as the 1970s, the world had only 31 democracies. Today it has uh, more than 100. Uh, half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain, uh, living under so, um, uh, uh, communist totalitarian dictatorships. Uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, Spain and Portugal were fascist dictatorships. Greece was under the control of a military junta, the, the colonels. Most of Latin America was under the control of military dictatorships. In East Asia, uh, South Korea and uh, Taiwan and um, uh, Indonesia, all under the control of dictatorships, all of them uh, democratic today. Uh, so today, a, uh, about two-thirds of the world's countries and two-thirds of the world's population lives in countries that are more democratic than autocratic. Uh, violent crime. In pretty much any part of the world that lives in a state of anarchy, rates of interpersonal violence will be high. And as states exert control over uh, territories, and uh, the code of vendetta gets replaced by the rule of law, rates of violent crime tend to uh, plunge. In medieval Europe, the homicide rate was about 35 per 100,000 per year. And uh, every Western European country brought it down to a rate of about 1 per 100,000 per year. That is, a contemporary European has about 1 35th the chance of being murdered compared to his medieval ancestors. And that's a process that tends to get repeated in any part of the world where frontier regions begin to come under state control. It happened in colonial New England. It happened in the American Wild West when the uh, sheriffs moved to town. Uh, and uh, it, it's happened in um, uh, Mexico and other Latin American countries. As you see, the rate remains high, but it is lower than, uh, than it used to be. If we zoom in on the, uh, just the last 50 years, we see the, that the United States, which had something of a reversal in the decline of violent crime in the 1960s, has reversed the reversal. And the, the homicide rate in the United States has fallen by more than half just since the 1990s. And indeed, for the world as a whole, the homicide rate is about 30% lower than it was just 20 years ago. Uh, it's not just homicide that's been reduced, but uh, violence against women, including uh, domestic violence and rape, down about 75% since data were first recorded in the early 1970s. And violence against children, violent victimization at school, such as bullying, and uh, physical abuse and sexual abuse by caregivers are all down since statistics were first kept. Indeed, we've been getting safer in just about every way. Uh, in the, thanks to advances in um, the safety uh, features of uh, automobiles, like seat belts and collapsible steering columns, design of better uh, highways, and better enforcement of, of uh, traffic laws, your chance of getting killed in a car accident has fallen by uh, about 98% in the last century. We are 90, uh, sorry, 88% less likely to be mowed down on the sidewalk. 99% less likely to die in a plane crash. 87% uh, less likely to fall to our deaths. 90% uh, less likely to drown. 91% less likely to be burned to death. And fire departments are putting themselves out of business. 
90 uh, percent less likely to be asphyxiated. There is one exception to this trend, uh, and that is the category that, that uh, safety statisticians call death by po accident, accidental death by poison, solid or liquid. And in this graph, you see the results of the American opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we're 95 percent less likely to be killed on the job. 89% uh, less likely to die of a so-called act of God, a fire, flood, earthquake, drought, uh, storm, meteor strike, and so on. Um, presumably not because God has become less uh, cross with us, but because of better, uh, more resilient infrastructure, better safety measures, better prediction systems. And what about the ultimate act of God? The, uh, the, the thunderbolt hurled by Zeus from the heavens, the literal bolt from the blue. Yes, we are 98% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. Uh, knowledge. In uh, early modern Europe, no more than 15% of people could read or write. Uh, Europe achieved universal literacy by the 20th century. Uh, as did the, the United States, and the rest of the world is close behind. Here you have data from uh, Chile, Mexico, and the world as a whole. Today, the 80% of the world's population can read and write, 90% of the world's population under the age of uh, 25. Uh, and uh, girls as well as boys, the world is very close to achieving gender parity in literacy. Uh, and Incredible as it may seem, this is perhaps the most unbelievable of all of the examples of progress that I will uh, try to document. We have been getting smarter. In a uh, well-replicated uh, phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, IQ scores have been increasing by three points a decade uh, throughout the 20th century, not because the world has embarked on a massive uh, selective breeding program, but uh, because of uh, increases in uh, affluence, in education, and in the trickling down of technical and abstract concepts from science and other domains of expertise into everyday discourse. Has it improved our quality of life, all of these advances in uh, vital statistics? Uh, well, the answer is in many ways is yes. In uh, the 19th century, uh, a typical work week in the United States and Europe was more than 60 hours. Today, it is fewer than uh, 40 hours. And um, nowadays, people have, on average, three weeks paid vacation. Would have been inconceivable in the 19th century. Uh, thanks to the uh, universal penetration of running water and electricity in developed countries, and the widespread adoption of labor-saving devices like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves and microwaves, the amount of time that we lose to uh, housework, which people indicate is their least favorite way of spending their time, has fallen from more than 60 hours a week in the uh, 100 years ago to fewer than 15 hours a week. Uh, as a result, the amount of uh, leisure time that we have has been increasing just in the last 50 years by uh, about 15 hours a week. Um, the rate leveled off for women starting in the 1990s, uh, and it turns out that this is because women today spend more time with their children. In fact, a single working mother today spends more hours with her children than a married stay-at-home mom did in the 1950s. So forget your stereotypes from Leave it to Beaver and uh, Father Knows Best. Well, do all of these gains in health, longevity, leisure, uh, and safety make us any happier? And the answer is, on average, uh, yes. Um, this is a, uh, a graph that plots self-rated life satisfaction against uh, the log of income. And the overall relation is, um, is uh, uh, linear in, uh, in a log scale, but uh, it bends over in uh, actual dollars. Uh, and it occurs not just in comparisons between rich and poor countries, but among the citizens within, uh, within every country. Um, and, uh, since uh, people in richer countries are happier, uh, since all countries have been getting richer, it, it predicts that people on average should be getting happier. And data, what data that we have that tracks people's happiness longitudinally shows that in 85% of countries, people have gotten happier over the last few decades. Interestingly, the United States is not one of them. Uh, American happiness has pretty much stagnated for 70 years. 
Well, I hope to have convinced you that human progress is not a matter of seeing the half glass as half full, but it is a, uh, an objective fact about, the, uh, about human history. How is this fact reflected in the news? Well, a study of um, sentiment mapping, the proportion of positive and negative words in news stories, has shown that during all these decades in which people have been living longer and healthier uh, lives, the New York Times has gotten steadily more morose. Uh, and for that matter, the a summary of the world's broadcasts uh, shows that the world's media have gotten glummer and glummer. So why do people deny progress? Part of the answer comes from a bit of our cognitive psychology called the availability heuristic, um, coined by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Namely, people estimate risk according to how easily they can recall examples from uh, memory. Now, combine that with the nature of the news. News is about stuff that happens, not about stuff that doesn't happen. You never see a uh, journalist saying, I'm reporting live from a country that has been at peace for 40 years, uh, or a city that has not been attacked by terrorists, or a uh, block where there have not, has not been any uh, shootings. Uh, also, news is about sudden events, not gradual changes. Uh, it's bad things can happen very quickly. Uh, but good things aren't built in a day, and they uh, creep up on us a few percentage points a year. The papers could have run the headline, Extreme Poverty uh, Decreased by uh, 137,000 People Yesterday. 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty. They could have had that he run that headline every day for the last 25 years. But you never saw that headline because it never, didn't happen all at once on a Thursday. And so the fact that more than a billion people have escaped from extreme poverty over the last 25 years was never reported anywhere. Uh, also, there's a phenomenon that uh, captured by a satirical headline by The Onion. CNN holds morning meeting to decide what viewers should panic about for the rest of the day. Um, there is a well-documented bias toward the negative uh, in the culture of journalism. Uh, and you combine the nature of news with the nature of cognition, and you can easily see why the world has been getting more dangerous uh, for a very long time indeed. Um, also, there's a, uh, a complementary phenomenon that psychologists sometimes call the negativity bias, that bad is stronger than good. We uh, think about and feel bad events more than good ones. Uh, we dread losses more than we anticipate gains. And this is especially true for recent bad events. As time passes, the negative emotional coloring of memories tends to fade. So in a sense, we are wired for nostalgia. Uh, hence the quote from Franklin Pierce Adams, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. <laughs> There's also a, uh, this sort of sets up a, a market for um, uh, entrepreneurs of doom, uh, that uh, uh, pessimism often sounds uh, serious, uh, optimism sounds uh, frivolous. As Morgan Housel put it, pessimists sound like they're trying to help you, optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> let, let me end with three questions about progress and enlightenment that I suspect have occurred to many of you. First, isn't it good to be pessimistic, to uh, become aware of uh, dangers and problems and injustices, to afflict the comfortable, to speak truth to power? The answer is not exactly. It's important to be accurate. Of course, we must be aware of problems and injustices where they occur, but it's also important to be aware of how they can be reduced. Because if you think that everything is getting worse and always has been, there are uh, attendant uh, dangers. Uh, one of them is fatalism. If uh, nothing that we have done has made any difference, uh, then why throw good money after bad? Why throw money down a rat hole? The poor will always be with you. Um, the other danger is radicalism. If every one of our institutions is failing and beyond all hopes for reform, then the rational response is mm, tear them all down, burn the empire to the ground, drain the swamp, smash the machine in the hopes that anything that rises out of the ashes is bound to be better than what we have now because things couldn't be worse. And uh, needless to say, that is a mindset that can lead to uh, utter catastrophe. Second question, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. Progress does not mean that everything gets better for everyone, everywhere, all the time. That would be magic. 
And progress is not magic, but problems, using knowledge to solve problems. Problems are inevitable, and solutions create new problems that must be solved in their turn. The problems that we face today are uh, unquestionably um, stupendous, particularly climate change and the threat of nuclear war. But I think the rational way to deal with them is not to treat them as apocalypses in waiting, that uh, we're, we're doomed, so eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, but rather to treat them as problems to be solved, um, that uh, we must deal with climate change by pursuing decarbonization through carbon pricing and low, zero, and eventually negative carbon technologies, and pursue denuclearization via international stability and uh, arms reduction. Just a couple of indications that these are not um, hopeless aspirations it comes to the fact that at least uh, bits of progress have been made. The um, carbon in uh, intensity of uh, the world, namely how much CO2 has to be emitted to achieve a dollar of GDP, has been uh, falling in all countries. And the even nuclear weapons, where it's hard to see any uh, bright side, but we have to remember that the world's nuclear arsenal is, has been reduced by 85% since the 1980s. The world has 10,000 nuclear weapons, which is terrifying. It used to have more than 60,000. Final question, does the Enlightenment go against human nature? Um, this is a question that is particularly poignant to me, since I am a uh, psychologist and human nature is what I study. Um, and, and I do believe there is such a thing as human nature with all its shortcomings and flaws. Um, many people ask, is, human, is humanism just too arid or tepid or flattened to sustain our uh, moral energy? Is the conquest of disease, famine, poverty, violence, and ignorance boring? Do people need to believe in magic, a father in the sky, a strong uh, chief to protect the tribe, myths of he heroic ancestors? Well, um, I don't think so. For one thing, um, the uh, secular liberal democracies are the happiest and healthiest places on earth and probably in the history of our species. They're the prime destination of people who vote with their feet. And I dare say that applying knowledge and sympathy to enhance human flourishing is heroic, glorious, maybe even spiritual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as, a, as a journalist and an entrepreneur of doom, um, I'd like to share the blame a little bit. So I wonder if you see other market forces that drive pessimism. I mean, whether it's for alarm systems or vitamins or SAT prep or a million things that people spend yeah. a lot of money on that is very profitable for. Well, well certainly uh, it is a, a way, pessimism is a way to appeal to our negativity bias. Our, uh, and the negativity bias is certainly uh, understandable. There really are more ways for things to go wrong than, for thing, than to go right. Uh, and uh, improvement progress is probably not something that our minds were evolutionarily prepared for. It's, a, I think, a gift of, of, uh, of the Enlightenment. Um, and uh, there's also a certain kind of, uh, kind of a, a gravitas, a feeling of moral superiority that, uh, that comes from, uh, that, that very tempting to academics, editorialists, uh, religious prophets, um, that uh, I, you are all complacent, naive, uh, thinking that things are okay, I'm here to tell you that uh, I know better and I am seeing um, the hazards that you, that you uh, may have missed. Uh, I think that's, that's a, a very tempting mindset. It's been commented on for centuries. Uh, my fav favorite quote uh, uh, commenting on it is more than 350 years old from Thomas Hobbes who said, uh, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence of antiquity, for men compete with the living, not with the dead. Namely, putting down the present is a way of putting down your rivals. It's a way for academics to look down on business people, for business people to look down on politicians, uh, and so on. Is there, from the point of view not of that elite, but of, of average people, is there such thing as maybe inflation, expectation inflation, where if I grew up with six channels on my TV that was black and white and I had to turn a dial and now I expect there to be a thousand or, you know, 30 kinds of lettuce in the supermarket instead of just dark green and light green. At some point, 
it seems as though we're, when you're living in a time this prosperous that just what your baseline is changes so radically. And I wonder if that makes it hard to appreciate actually how much has changed. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, in the, uh, uh, in the first draft of the article that I contributed to Time magazine, the one that where Bill Gates was the best editor, I cited a hilarious comedy skit from uh, Louis C.K., uh, which then became kind of real too, too discredited because of his uh, uh, revelations of his sexual misconduct, so I had to find a replacement. But in this, this is still well worth watching, um, called Everything is Amazing and Nobody is Happy. Uh, he, he notes how we get so used to the, the benefits of modernity that uh, we it very quickly, they very quickly change from a, an amazing per, uh, perquisite to a, a demand or a right. He gives a, an anecdote of how the first time he flew on a plane that had uh, Wi-Fi, I mean, internet access, you know, in the sky, and, uh, you know, which is amazing. You could you know, watch YouTube and uh, check your email at, at 30,000 feet, and then it, it, it went down, and the person next to him said, this is bullshit. He said, how quickly we, uh, uh, so we tr uh, take something that was only available five minutes ago for granted as an absolute right. Um, we could argue which of your enlightenment values is most robust. Um, but at the moment, I'm wondering about which you see as most vulnerable. And particularly, you started out about reason and the context of, of reason and its power. And at a moment when we are arguing about basic facts in our public life and not just how they should be interpreted, I'm wondering whether you remain as optimistic about the power of reason right now. Or is this just a, a momentary detour and not a real threat. Yeah, well, we, I, I think the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, and it's not so much, the, 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 the four uh, ideals in the subtitle weren't really so much um, causes for optimism in the sense of predicting that they will inevitably increase, but rather uh, things that we should value, that we should, it's really up to us uh, whether they will get better or worse. In the case of reason, there's a, a funny kind of inequality in, in reason. Uh, at the high end, We've never been more reasonable in the sense of having resources that are available for the application of reason to, to, to bettering human affairs. We've got in, um, uh, in, in medicine, we've got evidence-based medicine instead of the intuition and lore and superstition of doctors. In law enforcement, we have CompStat and other real-time uh, uh, crime uh, measurements that have uh, driven down the rate of, uh, of, of uh, homicide and rape in cities like New York. Uh, in politics, we have PolitiFact and other fact-checking, uh, which did not exist uh, several decades ago. We've got Wikipedia, we've got Snopes, we've got 538.com that aggregates polls. Uh, in area after area, we have the resources to really treat things more rationally. But then at the low end, we have the conspiracy theories and the fake news and the uh, uh, anti-vaxxers and, 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 uh, and so on. Um, so I don't know whether this is because of the democratization of media or because of maybe a side effect of uh, political polarization, that a lot of the flakiest uh, beliefs and uh, conspiracy theories aren't so much from scientific illiteracy or uh, they're really kind of propaganda tools in uh, prosecuting one's own uh, political crusade and demonizing one's enemies. I mean, it's not a coincidence that it was Hillary Clinton who ran that sex ring out at the pizza parlor in, in New York, rather than just the scandal of there being a child sex ring in a pizza parlor. It was a way of demonizing Hillary Clinton from those on the right, and there are complementary uh, conspiracy theory, theories on the left. So I think that a lot of the sources of unreason uh, really come from not an across-the-board unwillingness to deploy rationality, but uh, such an increase in political tribalism that we recruit all of our faculties in order to ad advance uh, a cause, but which is a source of irrationality itself, of course. Is, is part of that, and this speaks to your, your psychological background, is, is part of that that it is somehow more comfortable for us to believe what we hear from our tribe, even if it's wrong, than to believe what we hear from these ob objective sources, even if they are more demonstrably true? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that we, in fact, in, in psychology, I think there's only been a recent appreciation of how important our uh, tribalism is and how our cognitive faculties 
get recruited to advance our, uh, our own coalition. Um, and the idea that there exists a disinterested uh, uh, profession or guild or even mindset that you might be wrong and it's best for everyone if we swallow the occasions when we are wrong, let the facts tell us which of our beliefs are true or false, that's, that's very unnatural. Perhaps because the institutions of truth-seeking, like, like a free press, like science, uh, are so recent that we have not our mind has not accommodated itself to a world in which it's even that there exists some reliable way of ascertaining the truth. And so we tend to go with what uh, benefits our status within our tribe and our tribe relative to other tribes. I mean, not, not completely. Obviously, humans are not completely out of touch with reality, but the tribal instincts are very powerful. There was a, a recent, and I'm going to throw this open to you, but there was a recent um, article in Science that said that this period of post-war peace would have to continue for another 100 to 140 years to be st statistically significant. Do you buy that? Well, it's, um, I mean, that, that might be true in the sense that uh, in order to rule out the null hypothesis that the underlying rate of war has not changed over the last 500 years, um, then that, that's probably true. On the other hand, there is, um, you, you can look for a change in um, the rate of war with, with different um, statistical measures. That would be an extremely conservative one where you would really need literally centuries and centuries and centuries just to get enough statistical power to tell you one way or another. But another analysis from, from Norway which looked at, uh, would, more statistically sensitive, which asked the question, has there been a, uh, a change, a kind of break point? Uh, and if so, when is it? Uh, did adduce evidence for it, although it wasn't the one that I would have guessed. It suggested that the transition occurred around the in the uh, late 1960s, around the time of the dissolution with the Vietnam War, rather than 1945 at, after the Second World War. Who has a question for Professor Pinker? Yes, sir. Steve, there's a paradox in what you're telling us. You're telling us that overall reason is advancing, and then you tell us that the data has shown that we have reason to be optimistic, and of course reason supports data, data supports reason, and so you should have, or we should all be convinced, therefore, <laughs> that the world is getting better and better. But instead, as you yourself said, pessimism still is the mood of the day, especially in the West. So how, how do you explain the fact that even though reason tells us we should be optimistic, something else somewhere else tells us we should be pessimistic? What is that source? Yeah. Well, I think the uh, humans are capable of reason, and we have artificial institutions that try to bring out our reason, such as a free press and universities and science and courts of law and so on. But uh, they're always pushing, human nature pushes back. Uh, the, our natural tendency to find enemies and blame misfortune on them, to be uh, sensitive to everything that can go wrong, to reason by stereotype and anecdote and availability as opposed to data, and I think also shortcomings in some of our institutions in not adequately uh, diagnosing and treating our cognitive biases. The fact that often journalism encourages uh, fallacies based on the availability heuristic rather than pushing back against them by the use of data uh, has mean that, meant that we're not as successful at pushing back against our cognitive biases than, than we uh, ought to be. And there is a, I don't know if I want to, to dignify it as a movement, but there, there, there are many people who are aware of the research from psychology on cognitive biases who believe that a greater awareness of them should be inculcated early, that part of that one of the primary tasks of education ought to be to uh, teach kids to spot and circumvent their cognitive biases. And there should be refreshers at every stage of, uh, of development, including in academia and, and journalism. But very often, especially on editorial pages, you have pundits who just commit the elementary fallacy of saying something took place yesterday, therefore it's getting worse. Now that's just a fallacy, and that's, it's obviously obvious how to explain it. It's obvious what the cure should be, namely 
You aren't allowed to say anything about a trend until you go to the data. You can't use available examples. But it, it's an ethic that has not been disseminated uh, widely enough. Hi, Steve. Um, I have two questions. So one is whether there's been research to look at whether these perceptions of pessimism are moderated by age, so that if you ask someone who's 15, they're like, the world's great, it's better than it's ever been. And you ask someone who's 85, they have a very different answer. And if so, whether that can be explained by something mystical like nostalgia, right? Because people always think that the world in which they live is so much worse that there's been a degenerated state than the good old days. But the good old days keep getting recycled. Um, um, and then the second question is whether there's been any work that's looked at perceptions of purity, right? So you gave us sort of data, objective data on, you know, everything from famine to, you know, rates of murder. Um, but is there a sense that the world is less pure today? Mm. However you define that, whether it's, you know, destruction to the environment, whether it's all the plastics in the ocean, um, than it was a couple hundred years ago. Yeah, both, both, uh, both great questions. So there has been some research on the, uh, the illusion of the good old days. Why, uh, and, and you're absolutely right, as people get older, they tend to be, become nostalgic and wistful and, and uh, um, longing for the good old days. Part of it is that as we um, get older, we assume more responsibilities. We become parents, we become uh, breadwinners. Uh, and the world just seems so much more complex and threatening, uh, especially anyone who's you know, become a parent just knows that there are just so many ways for, for kids to, to die. Uh, you could you know, fall into a toilet and drown, and the world just seems like a really dangerous place as you get older, something that doesn't occur to you when, when, when you're younger. Also, people tend to confuse uh, changes in their own faculties, namely they are, you know, our, our, our memory declines and uh, in many ways, we become less vigorous, and, and people tend to project it onto the world as a whole. The world has gotten more uh, decrepit as we've gotten more decrepit. And as I, I mentioned, the, even though our memory for bad events uh, is, is better than our memory for good events, but the, how bad, the badness of the bad events tends to fade with time. And so we are, in a sense, predisposed to, uh, to some nostalgia. And, and I do think that various notions of purity, intuitions of purity, tend to uh, bleed into our moral sense. I know that uh, uh, my friend John Haidt was, was here. He had to catch a plane. But one of his uh, brilliant discoveries is that our intuitions of purity as opposed to contamination and carnality and um, uh, decadence tend to uh, bleed into our notions of morality. And we tend to assume that anything that is less clean, less pure, uh, and many things can give us the impression that something is less clean or less pure, tend to make us think that they're also uh, le less moral. And so I think it's a very powerful psychological phenomenon. Hi, Steve. <clears throat> How are you? Uh, uh, Steve, there's, of course, a lot to talk about clim climate change, but I believe the real danger is in the weather volatility. Much like in the stock market, it's not the stocks rising or falling, but it's the volatility, and a lot of evidence shows that the volatility of weather and climate is really increasing, way beyond the tolerance limits of our infrastructure, of our societies, of our highways, and so on and so forth, insurance systems. Uh, do you think the global community will be resilient enough what might confront us much sooner than people are uh, predicting? Yeah, well, certainly by, by climate change, I would include not just warming, but, uh, but volatility. It's the volatility. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, uh, uh, and, and clearly anything that reduces global warming will also reduce vo volatility, namely decarbonization. Um, I, I think actually, I mean, uh, that is a trend that is actually going in a, in a more positive direction. As countries get more affluent, they get more resilient to disasters. I showed the graph of deaths from nat natural disasters. Uh, like floods and droughts and so on, and there the, the world is getting more resilient. There are even I mean, there are some optimists. Uh, I'm not one of them. Sometimes called lukewarmers, that uh, acknowledge man-made climate change, but say that it's more important to get allow countries to get rich in part by burning fossil fuels, so that they can become more resilient, build better infrastructure, better seawalls, better flood control, more efficient agriculture, better desalinization 
desalination so that we can um, uh, adapt to the climate change that is inevitable no matter what we do. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think that's uh, uh, probably a little too optimistic. But on the other hand, there is an element of truth True. that anything that makes countries richer will um, mitigate the harm that would otherwise be caused by, by climate change. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much for okay, sharing all of this with us.